Help support The Candid Frame in bringing you awesome conversations with great photographers. You can do this by contributing as little as $2 a month to our Patreon campaign. That modest donation helps us to bring a quality show to you every week. Contribute today by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. This is Ibarri and X, and this is The Candid Frame. Photojournalist Michael Camber spent over a decade photographing war and conflict. Whether it was in Iraq, Afghanistan, Liberia, or the Congo, he and other men and women were there, telling stories with words and a camera, bearing witness to events that brought out the very worst and the very best in people. And while those of us back home viewed their images from the safety of our computer or tablets, journalists like Michael faced the harsh reality of war firsthand. And though that work would sometimes result in praise and awards, it was always important to have perspective. You know, you, you've gone there to, it's a cliche, but you've gone there to bear witness. There's no point in stopping, you know, when things get really bad. I mean, that's, that's sort of one of the reasons you've gone. You know, my friend Joao Silva always said, you know, he used to say, you got to remember when we're having a really good day and getting incredible pictures and winning prizes and, and getting pats on the back, that's the worst day these people have ever had in their lives, you know? And he, he would remind me of that all the time. He always just said, this is the worst day these people will ever see. Their kids are being killed. Their, their families are, are being wiped out. Yeah, I just try to bear that in mind. During that time, he made some remarkable photographs. But it was also a time when good friends died, many doing the same kind of work that he was dedicated to. It was the death of his good friend, Tim Hetherington, that eventually led to the founding of the Bronx Documentary Center, an organization that brings the power of documentary photography to an underserved community. It was an idea that they both had, but which eventually came into existence as a result of the tragic death of Tim Hetherington, along with Chris Hondros, in Libya. Tim was killed just after that conversation. That was the winter of 2011. He, he was killed in the spring. That was when some friends just came to me. I was, I was so kind of over, overwhelmed with grief that I wasn't really thinking clearly. And some friends came to me and said, you've got to start that center. You know, now is the time you have to start the center. And we did. And I'm not sure the center ever would have existed if Tim hadn't, hadn't been killed. We got a bunch of volunteers together and um, had five credit cards and we just did it, you know. There was, there was no budget. There was no, you know, people said, oh, well, you could write some grants and wait a few years and save money. We didn't do that. You know, we, we had Tim's film from Libya. Uh, from Libya. Uh, his, film, his film came back to me from Libya. You know, some of it was covered in blood. And we got, we got the film developed and we put together an exhibition. People showed up and we just kept going. We'll talk to Michael about how he experienced the changes in photojournalism during his stint at the New York Times and how he uses his love of photography to transform the lives of children in New York and elsewhere. And later, I'll talk to you about a fictional journalist in a seersucker suit and a straw hat and what he taught me about questioning authority. Welcome to The Candid Frame. Uh, well, Michael, welcome to The Candid Frame. It's a real pleasure and an honor to, to have you on the show. Thank you. Good uh, to be here. Uh, you just uh, pulled off the Latin American uh, Photo Festival recently, right. and I know you guys were really busy w- with with that. Um, right. How well did it go? And, and tell us a little bit about why you helped to coordinate that event. We've had photographers visiting from, you know, especially from Latin America. We have photographers just come in all the time. You know, uh, I would say every few weeks or every month or so, somebody shows up from Colombia or Mexico or. Puerto Rico. She says, hey, I'm in town. I think partly because the Bronx has such a large Latino population and a lot of our photographers are, are from South and Central America and the Caribbean. So over the years, we've established these really close connections with all these um, with all these Latino photographers, you know, to the south of us. And, um, you know, we got to know the work. We got to know what they were doing. Got to know that they have really interesting collectives happening down there. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a whole movement happening that I, I don't think most people know. I didn't know about it, you know. And, and I'm, I'm right here in New York City in the middle of it. You, you kind of, you get in the bubble and you think you know what's going on, but you don't. There's some great stuff out there. 
Yeah, it's so it's so easy to get get trapped in your own little circle, which is full and thriving. But <laughs> but because especially with the internet, it's like especially with with the show, I'm always researching photographers and I'm discovering this photography that's happening in Southeast Asia and South America, and it's just like <laughs> wow. I wish I had like a universal translator so I could interview all all those people. Exactly. Um, but it's cool. You know, the, the Bronx Documentary Center is really big about education, and that is really what, what rep- propelled it. But in my research with you, even when you were a working photojournalist, working for the New York Times and covering conflicts, you know, in, in different parts of the world, education seemed a part of what you felt the need to do beyond just simply telling a story. Right. Um, Tell me why that was important, especially when you were, you know, in on the combat stage in, in Iraq and elsewhere. I mean, I think, you know, I think there's 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 kind of a dual. There's two things, you know. One, of course, is the the whole nature of documentary photography is to educate, to give people evidence, to give people information. I've always been a huge believer in that. Um, but you know, within context, of course. And then, you know, everywhere I worked, there would be these young photographers would come to me. Some of them would have like, you know, some old beat up. Pentax camera from the 1980s or whatever, and they were trying to make a go of it. And they might be going around photographing press conferences or even car bomb scenes or, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, they would come, they would want advice. They would want, um, I want to be a photojournalist. How can I, can you help me? What do I need? Um, they needed everything from like technical training, you know, somebody to explain aperture and, and, and shutter speed to them to, um, you know, sometimes we would we would give them hand me down equipment, things we weren't using anymore. I think you know to to be able to train like a new generation of photojournalists, especially especially in places where they can't afford to go to an expensive school and get an expensive education. That was really something that um, I loved. I mean, I really really enjoyed that. I know, you know, I know Chris Hondros did it. Tim Hetherington did it. Friends of mine that were killed in the field. Tim especially was really, really focused on helping young young photographers in Africa. So, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, if we if we can train young people to carry on, especially people from, from their own countries, you know? Yeah. So that it's not a bunch of guys flying out of New York to cover this stuff, you know? You know that's one of the things that's, that's changed dramatically because back in you know early 70s and, and before then, right. a lot of the uh, photojournalists were formally trained. Either they had come through maybe through an institution like a college, but largely they had just come through the hard knocks of working on a sort of a daily paper or daily magazine. So that was sort of their training. And right. it seems like in, in more recent years with newspapers and magazines sort of pulling back from cover, you know, sending out people out there that it's falling more on freelancers to sort yeah. of go out there and tell these stories and and create a career for themselves were, were you finding that during your time there because during that time you were working for the new york, new york times did you find that that many of the people that were coming in were those kinds of freelancers that were for lack of a better word relatively green or were there still a number of people who were seasoned I would say when I was working overseas, I mean, I, I kind of caught the end of the era, you know, I, mm-hmm. I like to believe um, I was, er, you know, early 2000s um, covering Afghanistan and then going into West Africa and then on to Iraq. And, you know, the digital thing was just coming about and newspapers were just beginning to kind of disintegrate as a business model. And the technology was also taking off, you know, so all these things were happening at the same time. You know, I went in and, and worked with, with, you know, some of the greats, you know, with, with, you know, Jim Noctua and, you know, Chris Morris and, uh, you know, people from Magnum and Maggie Stieber in Haiti, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, some of the legends, I mean, really, really incredible, you know, photographers where, you know, we, we would we would go in, there was, people were getting paid, you know, a real rate to go in. Certainly before 9-11, we were still shooting film, you know, so it was pretty tricky to go out and correctly expose Kodachrome and, you know, focus your camera yourself and, yeah. you know, get the film correctly captioned and back to New York. I mean, it was, it was fairly complex stuff. And I did that and I, I sort of caught the, caught the end of that for a while, which was great. But I also, you know, come, I would say by like 2003, we started to see the whole thing fall apart. You know, there just wasn't money to send people anymore. Newspapers started um, shrinking down, shutting down, closing bureaus. And at the same time, you could give a local stringer who was, you know, ambitious and had a good eye, you could give him a digital camera and he could go out and take a usable photo. Mm-hmm. And, and for better, for worse, you could pay him $50, $75, you know, which I never thought was fair. But 
the fact is that that's what you could do and you could get a photo that was usable and you no longer had to send somebody from, from New York or Paris for, you know, $500,000 a day. So the whole thing kind of, you know, came together with sort of this, I don't know if it was a perfect storm or if it was just, you know, people in the marketplace responding to, you know, reality, but there are some tremendous young photographers out there. There were, you know, I knew a couple of photographers in Iraq. I mean, just incredibly, you know, one guy, they worked as a team. There were these two guys for AP. They worked as a team and one of them had a really bad leg, but he was a great photographer. And the other guy who wasn't such a good photographer would carry him on his back. They would go to these things. He would put them on his back and the guy would come up and like shoot over the crowd and get oh, these wow. great photos. I mean, you would just see people, they would always find a way. They were super resourceful. They wanted to shoot. And once they were given the resources and the, the, a little bit of training to do it, I know, I, I know Getty did a great job. Reuters and AP did a great job. Certainly for what I saw was in Iraq where there were all these bureaus and as it got too expensive and too dangerous to send in Westerners because of kidnapping issues, they started hiring and, and training these, uh, you know, Iraqi photographers. And these guys won Pulitzer Prizes. I mean, they did amazing yeah, work. Yeah. Just, they're, they're actually running the bureaus today. They're actually in charge of these bureaus today. And that was an amazing thing to say. That was great. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, 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 that's good. Because I think it's, it's something I, I, I've thought about, you know, because historically, you know, it, when the U.S. or a European country was in conflict, the, the reporters and the photographers were from those respective countries. And the people who, who lived there, you know, who were, who were experiencing all of that death right. and all that destruction, really didn't have a voice outside of their own communities. And then, despite the fact that they weren't being paid what we would consider a, a fair a fair rate, it, it, it transformed the dynamic into these people being empowered to tell their stories in a way that guys like you and me wouldn't be able to. So I think, I think that's probably yeah. one of the more valuable yeah. um, outcomes of, you know, of the newspaper magazine industry changing as much as it has. It is, it is, because, you know, these are the guys, I mean, I remember I had friends, you know, their brothers had been kidnapped. They had, you know, cousins who'd been killed in car bombings. I mean, they were living in neighborhoods controlled by militias. They, they lived it. They weren't, you know, I would go in for a few months at a time, you know, some, sometimes longer. But these guys were, were living it every day and they really knew the reality and they knew how to represent it. Did you're working with them and dialoguing with them, did that influence the way that you saw the conflict? You know, did it the result in you ending up seeing it in a different way than you might have been had you just been going out and not having these 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 kinds of relationships, professional and personal, with these photographers and news uh, and writers who were from from the area that you were covering? Definitely, definitely, without a doubt. I think um, you know th- there's been too much. Emphasis, I would say, on, you know, the bang, bang pictures, you know, mm-hmm. I think getting to know these guys, you know, you uh, look, the story is always with the civilians, you know, it's always the story is always with with the people who are having to live with the outcome of this war, you know, pictures of guys firing guns, you know, you might need a few of those, but basically, it's really about the civilians. And I think, um, you know, living and being friends with and, and working with, uh, with photographers on the ground and seeing what their families went through and such. Yeah, I think it reminded. I think it was a constant reminder. Reminder that the, the story is with the civilians. And you, you can probably explain it better than than, than I can. But I, I'm. I would really love to hear your perspective on it because when I think about it, here, are, if I were out there photographing, it, it's one thing to see buildings, you know, shot up with holes because of you know bullets and bombs and all those other things. It's another thing to witness and photograph the people who lived in those buildings mm-hmm. who lost children relatives friends yeah. and and to have that sort of emotional toll that it takes on you just as a human being of being in the midst of all that that grief and that and, and that pain mm-hmm. and was that somehow and i think a, a lot when i think a lot of photojournalists they, they think about okay i'm just i'm doing my job i'm trying to get right. the story out but when you build relationships with the people that are actually suffering in, in the form of these other photographers and these other journalists, and they're telling you their stories and their experiences. How does that temper or change, if at all, the way you do your job? Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, I think, um, you know, my traditional response is always like when you're in the moment, you know, you've, you've gone all this way to get the picture. So, uh, you know, you keep working, you know, you, you see, 
you know, I mean, the worst of it, of course, is seeing kids who've been killed. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you've gone there to, it's a cliche, but you've gone there to bear witness. There's no point in stopping, you know, when things get really bad. I mean, that's, that's sort of one of the reasons you've gone. You know, my friend Joao Silva always said, you know, he used to say, you got to remember when we're having a really good day and getting incredible pictures and winning prizes and, and getting pats on the back, that's the worst day these people have ever had in their lives, yeah. you know? And he, he would remind me of that all the time. He always just said, this is the worst day these people will ever see. Their kids are being killed. Their their families are, are being wiped out. Yeah, I just try to bear that in mind. But um, I don't know. You know, I'm still I'm still trying to come to terms with, I'm still, um, I mean, I haven't looked at my Iraq photos in years. You know, I'm still trying to kind of get up the courage to go, <laughs> to start going through them. And I mean, I've got nine, I worked there from 2003 to 2012, you know, so I was in and out for nine years. I, I probably, I don't know, I've probably got hundreds of thousands of photos. I don't even know how many photos I have, you yeah. know, kind of trying to screw up my courage to go and start looking through it again and try to figure out what it means and what, what toll. Cause it's easier to just like put it in a closet and close the door and kind of pretend it's not affecting you, but it's affecting you. Yeah. I think, um, about being in that, that, that's, you know, that, that arena for day after day for as long as you were. And I wonder about those quiet times, you know, when you're back at wherever you're staying, you know, you know, getting some rest, you're hearing that stuff that, you know, the bombs or the, you know, whatever this stuff is, is just outside your, your window and realizing that I have to go back out there. Right. <laughs> and I, I, cause there are some days in here, I don't even want to leave my house and I, there's nothing even close to that kind of stuff happening. Yeah. And yet somehow I yeah. have to go, I got to get things done. I got to get out of the house. How does, how is that magnified? When yeah. it's life or death happening outside that that door, how do you sort of yeah. gird yourself up on those days where you feel like I might be better? I might be. I might, it might be better just to stay exactly where I am today. Yeah, I don't know, man. You ever, you ever get that that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach? You know, it's it's almost like nausea. You know, you you hear something big go off, or you know, sometimes the house would shake. You know, mm-hmm. from some enorm- enormous explosion, you'd know it was clear by. You knew you had to go out, and it was just like. Oh, that, what I just felt, the wall shaking, that was 20 or 30 people being blown to pieces. You know, that was the instant in which a dozen or a few dozen people just got killed. And now we got to go out and take pictures of it. And man, I'm telling you, there is no, no worse feeling anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, um, it's, you feel nauseous. I mean, you feel nauseous because you grab your camera and you're like, okay, we have to do this, but it's, it's nauseating just to go out. I think the only way I could do it is working with a team. You know, I usually, I usually I work with, with Joao Silva or sometimes, you know, Tyler Hicks or, I mean, um, Dexter Filkins. You know, if you had a team around you, Lindsay Dario, you know, if you had a team, it made it easier. Warzer Joff, you know, some of the great, great Iraqis that helped us out and really, really made it all possible. I mean, if you had a team uh, in, 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 in Africa, I was mostly working with Lydia Polgreen, just wonderful, you know. If you were on your own, I don't think you could face it. I just don't think you could. But I feel like if you have the support and there's like two or three people like, okay, we got to go do this. We have to go do this. You yeah. know, it, it, it pushes you to go out and confront it. If I was on my own, I think I would just kind of huddle in the back room and pretend I didn't hear it or something, you know. Was was the reason that helped you do it is because you felt like you couldn't get let these people let these people down that somehow it was like your yeah. own you know band of brothers and sisters that you just felt like we're doing this together we got to be there yeah yeah yep Car- Carol and Cole in, in in Haiti and other places yeah I think you know we're we're taking some heavy hits today as journalists but um, mm-hmm. man I thought there was no nobler cause and I think I was with people who really believed it was it, there was no nobler cause you know I really think. We were with people that we were going to go out and we were going to show the world what's going on out here and it's going to make a difference. We're, we're helping to write history here today. You know, I really, I really believe that. You know, good photography. You know, we're helping, we're helping to, to create a record of the American intervention in Iraq or, you know, the Civil War in Liberia, whatever it was, you know. And, and these pictures will, will last forever and they will become part of the record and we have to do this, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's, if you're with a few people that, that are true believers, I think you can, you can really do a lot. I, I don't, I don't say it's your, your cur- courageous because people would say, oh, you, you know, you must have a lot of courage. No, not at all. I'm just, you know, scared <laughs> to death the whole time. But, um, you know, it, it's, you got, you got to do it. I mean, I'm a true believer in, in journalism and photojournalism. I, I really am. But how do you, how do you sort of resolve or sort of process that commitment when, 
your friends like Zwa gets critically wounded, loses his limbs, or they die, like in the case of Chris Hondros and Tim Hetherington, where you know you lose these people, and you're still out there sort of doing the work, and you're in your. And I'm sure that it gives you some food for thought in terms of why am I here? Do I keep doing this? Right. So, I think you know. I mean, to be perfectly honest, there was. Um, and I started covering conflict in the 1980s, you know. I did it off and on, but really, I did it for about, after 9-11, I did it pretty much, you know, not not nonstop, but I did it, covered, you know, 12 conflicts, I think, for over a period of 10 or 11 years. And just before Tim was killed, you know, Tim Hetherington was killed, um, I mean, we were roommates and close friends, and it started to catch up. We knew more and more guys that were getting killed, and, and you know, I did make a conscious decision to kind of, get out while I could. Tim and I talked about that. You know, it was, it was, you know, maybe, maybe now's a good time to get out. Like we still, we're still alive. We've done this. We've made a difference. Um, the business is changing. It's getting harder and harder to get assignments. And Tim wanted to keep going and he wanted to keep going for the right reasons. He didn't go for the money. You know, Tim went back. He said, I want to, he said, I, I, I need to document and, and, and give evidence of, of men in, in war. You know, he said, that's what, I'm committed to, and he went. He went back to Libya for the right reasons, you know. Chris Hondros too, you know, and 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 other friends of mine. I can tell you, they weren't in it for the money, you yeah. know. But there was there was definitely a time where I kind of said, um, you know, I think it coincided with changes in the media because there were there were days days in in Liberia in particular, in Iraq and other places where you thought, okay, we might get killed out here today, but it's worth it. It's for a noble cause. We're doing the right thing. By 2011, 2012, you started to see. Uh, attention spans shrink, you know, just smaller and smaller. And you'd kill yourself, you know, or I shouldn't use that. You'd, you'd, you'd work hard to, to turn out a photo essay uh, or get a picture on the front page of the Times and there'd be no response. You just, you could see that the response was dwindling to, yeah. to what you were doing. And that was kind of the time when I decided to get out, you know? So uh, again, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm not sure I answered no, your question. No, you're good, man. This is podcasting. You, can, you feel free to ramble as much as you need to. Well, that, that your friendship and your relationship with Tim was the germ for what is now the Brock's Documentary Center. Right. So tell us about those discussions that you had and, and how, after the passing of Tim, uh, you moved to make this actually into a, re- a reality. Yeah. I mean, Tim and I talked for years about, uh, wouldn't it be cool if we had a, a place where we, could, where we could teach kids? Wouldn't it be cool if we had a a gallery space or an educational space. And it was just kind of talk for a while. We, we joked, Oh, maybe we could do something in Africa or set up a center in Afghanistan or something. But, um, I wanted to come back to the Bronx. You know, I, I had saved up some money and I wanted to come back and buy a place. I bought, I bought this, this place in the Bronx here, an old, it's kind of this, this old building from the 1870s that had been abandoned and had been the center of the drug trade. It had been a brothel for a while. We, I took it over and Tim came up and we, we walked through it and we said, yeah, this is, this is the place. You know, there was a big storefront. It was just what we were looking for in terms of education for, for children and, and photographers. But once we started crunching the numbers, there was just no way we could do it. We just, there was no money. We had, you know, no grants, et cetera. So we said, well, you know, let's talk about it in a few years. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll do something else in the meantime. And um, Tim was killed just after that conversation. That was the, um, that was like the winter of 2011. He, he was killed in the spring. That was when some friends just came to me. I was, I was so kind of over, overwhelmed with grief that I wasn't really thinking clearly. And some friends came to me and said, you've got to start that center. You know, now's the time you have to start the center. And, um, and we did. And I'm not sure the center ever would have existed if, if Tim hadn't, hadn't been killed. But um, we got a bunch of volunteers together and um, had five credit cards and we just did it. You know, wow. there, was, there was no budget. There was no, you know, people said, oh, well, you could write some grants and wait a few years and save money. We didn't do that. You know, we, we had Tim's film from Libya. Uh, from Libya. Uh, his, film, his film came back to me from Libya. You know, some of it was covered in blood. And uh, we got we got the film developed, and we put together an exhibition, and uh, people showed up, and we just kept going. You know, we just kept going. You know, with or without money, we made it happen, and we always have. We had thousands and thousands of kids come through here now. You know, you know, youth and, te- and teens, uh, and it's it's made a difference. Yeah, it's just kind of interesting to see the career that you had covering conflict, doing all that, and 
And then faced with being basically an administrator, trying to create something from scratch and all the challenges and the drama that that entails. Yeah. Um, was there anything about your career as you know a photojournalist dealing with things moment by moment that helped you when it came time to starting and running an organization like this? Well, I would say, you know, a lot of what we, we when you're trying to get out the, the word, trying to trying to attract a buzz and tr- attract attention and get high quality work. I mean, it, it all came from my contacts and, and friendships I've built up over 20 years. So we were able to get fr- friends in from The New York Times and friends in from, you know, Magnum and just um, kind of create a reputation as a place that did high quality work. We immediately started, you know, showing, um, you know, photographers of color, black and Latino photographers that weren't being shown elsewhere. I think right off the bat, we uh, we were able to, a lot of what happens, I don't know about all, elsewhere, but in New York, a lot of what happens is through friendships and connections, mm. for better or for worse. That did help. In terms of solid skills, I think, um, yeah, I'm not much of it, to this day, I'm not much of an administrator. You know, it's just, it's not my strength. I'd, I'd worked as a mechanic and a carpenter for about 10 years before I got going as a photographer. And that, that helped tremendously because, you know, we, we build everything, we make things the way we want. Um, a lot of running a space is actually about physically creating the space, and that was something that we had some experience with. But um, I think I think the main thing is having having the eye to really um, be able to see the important work and and be able. There's all this, you know, thousands and thousands of people out there working and doing projects, and sometimes sending sending you projects and being able to kind of see through it and figure out what is the important work that we need to show here. Yeah, and it seems like the, the the you know the organization is multifaceted. I mean, in one respect, you're providing education to to kids in terms of after school programs, not just mm-hmm. teaching them photography, but really teaching them storytelling, especially right. the value of telling their own stories. Then right. you have bigger events like the the, the exhibit of the Latin American photographers right. that you just had. You have speakers coming in uh, as well, um, not right. only for the kids in that community, but for the general photographic community so it seems like it's pretty diverse in terms of its um terms of its offerings how in terms of how it's evolved from its initial manifestation it's you know its initial roots how has it how has it changed and, and where are you hoping to take it you know from its original roots we 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 opened the doors as a gallery we we wanted to do education immediately we did i think we waited a year year and a half to really get um, some of our classes going. We started with seven kids. Um, we've built it up. We've got uh, more than 50 uh, students and then plus, plus an adult. So probably close to 100 students altogether now. That That's changed. You know, we, we originally started thinking that we were going to be a gallery space. And I think, um, um, you know, education was part of it. But I think education is, is really becoming the core of what we do. Um, it's where we just see a remarkable change. I mean, uh, kids come in all the time. You know, they are not familiar with the press, not familiar with the media, don't understand the difference between Democrat and Republican or, um, you know, communism or capitalism or just any number of things. They're not stupid kids. These are just not things that they're getting in school. You know, it's pretty remarkable when you get a a class of high schoolers in and not a single kid can tell you the two political parties in the United States. And we don't really, you know, we don't specifically educate them in politics at all. You know, we're, we're, we're actually pretty specifically non, non ideological. Um, very clear about that, mm-hmm. but we're exposing them to all kinds of stuff. We've got them doing readings. We've got we're taking them on field trips. We're exposing them to um, we've got all kinds of photographers coming through and doing you know free workshops with them and showing them work from all over the world. And within a year, you see an extraordinary change. You see these kids who are so much more involved in the world. You know they're they're understand what's happening in Africa, in Europe. You know themes around immigration, around the environment. I mean. Depending on what school they go to, there's some good schools in New York City, but there's some terrible schools. And I, I think we're just seeing enormous, enormous changes in the youth. And I think we feel strongly that there's an ability to completely change, change the lives of some teenagers. Yeah, yeah, I, we've seen incredible change. Yeah. I mean, you really, you really see see kids who are. They'll tell you that their lives are transformed. Um, we started a college access program, just all kinds of things that we never thought we would do. We never imagined we would do these things. But when you've got kids who are graduating from high school and they've never talked to a college counselor. And they're not planning on going to college. Then you got to step in. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I was thinking about the kids that you serve in that in that community, and as you said, it's largely uh, Latino uh, immigrant immigrant community. Uh, it's kind of kind of the area that I grew up in South LA. And 
in uh, a video that I saw, uh, you were talking about your time in, in Iraq and the things that you would do in order to sort of ensure your safety in terms of like the clothing that you wear, um, mm-hmm. how you would like associate with certain people, you know, and all those things you did in order to keep yourself relatively safe. And I couldn't help but think, man, those those kids do exactly the same thing. Did yeah. did did did, did yeah. that did that the recognition of that mm-hmm. sort of uh, help you to sort of. Uh, gain a perspective on the kids that were coming into um, into your in, into the center. Did you ever think uh, about it? That's a tough question. You know, I think um, more and more I see um, violence as kind of being the deciding factor in so many things. And the Bronx is better than it was, but there's still way too much violence. And when we see kids that can't come to an after-school program and talk to their parents, it's usually because of the violence. Uh, when we see people who are not eating healthy. Believe it or not, they say, well, we're too scared to go to the, the grocery store, so we're ordering, we're living on fried chicken or something, you mm-hmm. know. I think violence has so many kind of ancillary spinoff effects that we don't take into account, and it's something I've been intimately involved with. It's something that our kids are intimately involved with, unfortunately. We're doing, I'm doing a lot of thinking about how we, can, how we can mitigate that violence. I think it's really at the core of, of what, you know, I want to do. I think once you, you, you stop that and achieve a certain level of peace, then everything else becomes possible yeah. what, are we, what are some of the stories that that you've been that has been particularly gratifying for you to to help facilitate with these kids that they've created as a result of going out there and working your program and and, and yeah. finding a way the stories are there any any particular stories that really stand down to you this um this past term our students uh, did a big project on um sort of four decades of Bronx activists, different types of, of activists. It's, you know, it's we're in one of the poorest communities in America. There's a long history of activism here, you know, environmental activism, um, you know, activism around um, policing, around education, around healthcare, around all kinds of things. And um, they, they did a tremendous project where they went out and found, you know, people from the 1960s up until, um, up until teenagers today who are fighting against gun violence, you know, kids who are 15, 16. I was, they shot film and, and developed film. They shot it all with a uh, Hasselblad, you know, two and a quarter old, old beat up Hasselblads, um, made the prints, uh, really a tremendous project. And I think it inspired and instilled a level of um, sort of understanding of, of the larger issues. I think that was, that was really gratifying. Um, we, we don't teach kids to be activists. We teach kids to document the activists, you know? Yeah. Um, so I want, I do want to be clear on that, but yeah, su- super gratifying project. Um, and then just we've got a bunch of kids who are going to college that didn't expect to go to college. You know, I, I know it sounds not that dramatic, but it's a big deal when you've got kids who, who said, oh, I wasn't really, nobody really talked to me about it. And, and we're insisting they apply to college and suddenly they're getting into college and they're, they've got a different plan for their life. I mean, that's, that's a game changer. Yeah. So, and we're going to try to keep them in college too. It's not so easy. Oh, yeah. Getting in is one thing. Staying in. Yeah, I witnessed that a lot when I was coming up in school, and I can only imagine it was harder. But I would see a lot of uh, students of color that would get up into these institutions. I went to I went to Berkeley and I, right. I and I could understand. And I was a little older. I think that helped me. But I yeah. think part of what happens is that they get there and there's an immediate sense of isolation. Right. Because right? you may have gone to a school in the Bronx or in South L.A. or south of Chicago that's dominated by uh, the same sort of ethnic group, same food, same yeah. social structure. And all of a sudden you, you are thrown into an environment when you're 18 or 19 years old that is yeah. completely foreign. And whatever support you might have had before right. is completely gone. And you really rely, yeah. you have to rely on yourself. Granted, there's help there. But it's, I, I think part of, part of the issue is that it isn't necessarily ingrained in these kids that it's okay to ask for help. Because when right. you come from those neighborhoods, you, asking for help or admitting that you need help is a sign of weakness. So even though the institution is designed to support that transition, right. I think part of the resistance and why a lot of kids end up dropping out is that they that that basic sensibility of, oh, I need help with this, I should go ask someone, right. is is completely antithetical to how they've grown up. Right, right. And now you're asking them to make this, you know, to you it might seem like a simple change, not simple at all. So yeah. we're working on some of this stuff. Again, it's not stuff I ever dreamed that we would do, but it's it's important and it's rewarding. Yeah. So, yeah. How's, do you, are you still taking pictures? Yeah, I am. I am. I've been, um, 
shooting um, portraits and landscapes for the last few years um, since I came back to the Bronx, really. And I'm trying to, because I, I, this is where I started photographing is that, you know, I was 20, 21, 22 years old when I moved to the Bronx, you know, back in the 1980s. And um, it's really where I became a photographer. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of still shooting up here and I'm going through 30 years of pictures from the Bronx trying oh, to create wow. a book. It's, it's tough. I sometimes wish I hadn't taken so many photos. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just going through stuff that I shot 25 years ago. I'm working, I've been shooting downtown Los Angeles for over 25 years. And I had a bunch of Kodachrome that I hadn't looked at, looked at in 20 years. And wow. I finally braved to go back in there. And part of my fear was just like going through those pictures and realizing, oh, this is all crap. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> so it was, and it was, thankfully I found enough images that I, I felt okay. But it really is uh, sort of an interesting thing to go back, especially when you produced a lot of work, right. and to go back to it and kind of discover the photographer that you were there, right. it's it's it can be gratifying. It can be absolutely uh, demoralizing. It can be frightening, um, especially you know considering how much you invested in, in terms of your life over yeah. the span of those years. Um, yeah. it's hard coming to terms with it, but you know you also feel like you're getting older, and and you know I, I was in West Africa for seven years, you know. Nobody's ever seen those photos. Aside. They were published in the New York Times, you know, mm -hmm. for 24 hours and then they vanished, you know. There's just so much work, you know, and as you get older, you think, this work's all going to disappear if I don't do something with it, you know. So. What happens with most of your friends in terms of their work? Because they're in the same, same boat. I mean, I'm increasingly focused on books. I'm, I, you know, I think, I'm sure you too, you know, we're all, we're all lovers of, of, of great photo books. I mean, a great photo book is just the best thing in the world. You know, the, that market has changed a lot, you know, to now you have to pay to publish your own books, you know, whereas in mm -hmm. the past you got paid. So I think a lot of us are trying to come to terms with, with that and, um, and find ways to get, get our, 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 our work out there. I just think, you know, I'm just not that, I mean, the internet is the internet. It's, it's great. It's, it's, um, you know, wonderful in a lot of ways, but it's so fleeting and transitory. And, um, uh, again, you know, I'm somebody who grew up, you know, working as a mechanic and making things with my hands. I just... I think a lot of us feel like books are, are super important and we want to um, be able to pass our work down through books, yeah. pass our work on through books. And, and while, while we're on that topic, why don't you talk a little bit about the book that you helped to edit in terms of the uh, profiles on different photojournalists and their stories? Right. right. Yeah. I did, um, you know, there's a book called Photojournalists on War, Untold Stories from Iraq. And basically as I was working... Um, I would, whenever I got together with my, my friends and colleagues, I would just turn on a tape recorder and let them talk, you know, sometimes for hours at a time. When I got back to New York, I mean, I did these interviews for more than five years. You know, I, I did something like 80 interviews and I did them all over the world. You know, I might be in Afghanistan or wherever it was, but I would interview people about the war in Iraq and their, their, their experiences and memories and um, kind of the, the behind the scenes. People just told incredible, incredible stories. It was all the stuff that didn't make it into the newspaper, you know, that didn't make it into the magazines. But such gripping, important historical stuff. At a certain point, I said, oh, man, this has got to be a book. We have to do a book. So yeah. um, we ended up with 40, cut it down to 40 photographers. They each have a chapter. Um, it's each, each photographer telling, like, you know, the behind-the-scenes stories about the Iraq War. And um, then they each would have a selection of their photos, you know, maybe seven to ten photos. I mean, you know, people tell me that it's become certainly one of the visual histories, you know, one of the, the, the go-to histories of the Iraq war. When, when you want to know what happened in Iraq, um, that's one of the books to go to. And that's, uh, it's none of my work is not in it, but you know, it, it's gratifying to put it together, to assemble it and, and see that, you know, that's really what it is. There's a lot of great work out there, but it's not being, it's not being collated. It's not being assembled. It's not being turned into something that people can, can wrap their minds around a lot. That's, that's what I strongly believe. So these people who are going out there and starting their careers now who are doing that since the newspaper and magazine outlets aren't what they were in the past, where do you go to see that work? I think that's a, I think that's a tough question. I do think, um, I think increasingly it's books. I think really books are the only place where you can, if you want to go in depth, if you want to look at 100 photos in context and sequenced and presented the way the photographer really intended you know, and with some written words around them that, that really fully, fully explain what you're looking at. 
I think you have to go to books. You know, I, it's nice to see a, a slideshow on the web with 10 pictures, but yeah. it's not enough. You know, uh, the magazines are not doing so well. You know, the last time I picked up a copy of Time magazine, it, oh, yeah. I, I, it looked like a six page advertising supplement. I couldn't believe it was the whole magazine. You know, I don't I, I think increasingly we're turning to books that may change. I mean, things go in cycles. But right now, um, that, that's what I'm looking at. I'm yeah. seeing some great books out there. People are publishing some, you know, Twin Palms, Mac, you know, Aperture always, um, uh, Red Hook Press. You know, there, there's a bunch of people doing some really great work. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? Wow. Um yeah, it's one Juanita Escobar. Okay. Uh, we we just showed her work. Escobar is E S C O B A R, and uh, she did a ten year project on cowboys in uh, Colombia and Venezuela. And man, these are some of the most beautiful pictures I've I've seen in a long time. Just really, really in depth. Um, the way she sees is beautiful. Uh, I think it's just like some next level stuff. Oh, really awesome. incredible. And I think she's completely unknown. She lives in, uh, I think she lives in Bogota. She's, she's Colombian. Oh, I look forward to seeing her work. Yeah, Juanita. It's, it's, it's tough to say one photographer, but yeah, Juanita. <laughs> as far as, well, Michael, it's, thank you so much for your time and your generosity. I really do appreciate it. Really enjoyed talking with you. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Stay well now. Each week, we have a segment on the show where I share thoughts, ideas, and memories that may or may not involve photography. We call it The Last Frame. It was 1972, the sophomore year of a new decade. It had been four years since the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. Three years after NASA sent a rocket into space and Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon. The Beatles had broken up. Walt Disney World had opened its doors in Central Florida, and the number one song on the Billboard charts was The First Time I Saw Your Face by Roberta Flack. Gas was 55 cents a gallon, and a Kodak pocket camera cost you only 29 bucks. Television was dominated primarily by three networks, each of whom competed for the nation's attention with programs like All in the Family, Bonanza, The Flip Wilson Show, and Mannix. But it was ABC who, on January 11th, aired a film on its show, The ABC Movie of the Week. On that night, the film began on a close-up of a Sony TC-40 tape recorder. And as the camera pulled back, we saw a tousled, middle-aged man held up in a modest hotel room. He grabbed a beer and sat on his bed holding a notebook onto which he'd written the words now emanating from his recorder. Chapter One. This is the story behind one of the greatest manhunts in history. Maybe you read about it, or rather what they let you read about it probably is some minor item buried somewhere on a back page. However, what happened in that city between May 16th and May 28th of this year was so incredible that to this day, the facts have been suppressed in a massive effort to save certain political careers from disaster and law enforcement officials from embarrassment. This will be the last time I will ever discuss these events with anyone. So when you have finished this bizarre account, judge for yourself its believability, and then try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, it couldn't happen here. The film was the Night Stalker, and it was the world's introduction to a tenacious reporter by the name of Carl Kolchak. Now, the Night Stalker is, by any description, a horror film. It begins with a series of mysterious murders off the Vegas Strip, where the victims have been completely drained of blood. It's a vampire movie. And so it has all the common motifs, including sharp teeth, a wooden stake, and a creepy old house. And while it, it, it doesn't reinvent the genre, it does provide some interesting flourishes, including being set in Las Vegas and a subplot involving city politics. And despite its modest budget and lack of visual effects, the film succeeds in being both creepy 
and scary, even after all these years. But it wasn't the scares that made such an impression on me. It was the character of Carl Kolchak, played by character actor Darren McGavin. In his hands, the fraggle but relentless reporter was an incredible force of will, who despite his many career downturns, largely of his own doing, was still in pursuit of that one story that would turn his career around. Though reluctant at first to take on this crime story, he was soon convinced that the killer was more than your average homicidal maniac, but a creature of the night. And it was his conviction and his desperation to make this story the one that turns his fortunes around that captivated my imagination. I grew up and was educated in Catholic school. And one of the things they drum into you, at least back then, was that you don't question authority. You do as you're told. Even if things don't seem exactly right, it wasn't your place to push back and question the motive and the authority of those in power. Kolchak was the antithesis of that belief, constantly resisting the will of the police, the politicians, and especially his editor, Vincenzo, played by Simon Oakland. Kolchak. Shelley Forbes has got to be his fifth victim. Look at the way her dog was killed. You'll never give up, do you? What do you mean? I mean, this is unacceptable. Unacceptable? Kolchak, I'm very close to firing you, even though the owner of this paper has a soft spot in his head for has-been big city reporters. I am tired of your pressure, Kolchak. I am tired of the owner's pressure. I'm tired of the pressure from all around me to blow the story up on the one hand and keep it under wraps on the other. I am tired of being the middleman, Kolchak. Do you understand that? Can you understand that? What do you want, Vincenzo? A testimonial from Count Dracula? Out! Get out! What is this out, out, get out, get out game we play? This nut thinks he is a vampire. He has killed four, maybe five women. He has drained every drop of blood from every one of them. Now that is news, Vincenzo. News! And we are a news paper. We are supposed to print news, not suppress it. I love that speech. I love its passion, its sincerity. Yeah, I know, it's a horror movie, but there was a truth in those words that was forever etched in my young mind. I felt some of that same passion when I joined the newspaper at Los Angeles City College and had my initial experiences as a reporter. It was there that I learned to become a writer and a photographer, and on many occasions, I worked on stories that involved interviewing administrators, union reps, and board members who were not always forthcoming with the truth. But suddenly, I had permission to question and to wonder whether what I was being told was the complete truth. I learned how to confirm whether it was or not, and empowered by my advisor to follow up when things just didn't line up. It provided me a sense of confidence I'd never experienced up to that point, and that I'd glimpsed only in that fictional character years before. Unfortunately, the sequel and the television series that followed failed to capture that lightning in the bottle that was the Night Stalker. McGavin tried his best, but the series devolved into Monster of the Week episodes. But even then, there was always that beautiful doggedness of Kolchak. Now, I admit that Kolchak is a flawed and even tragic character. He is a man driven by his passions, often blindly so. So the end of the film is both satisfying and heartbreaking. Yet, there is something incredibly satisfying about the character, especially as he pronounced his final words penned by the legendary screenwriter Richard Matheson. So that's it. The book's finished. And now you'll have to judge for yourself. I must warn you, however, if you try to verify this account, you will find it quite impossible. Item, in Washington, D.C., there was no longer a file listing the suspect under his true name or any of his alleged aliases. Item, in Las Vegas, all of those who were involved have either left town, aren't talking, or are dead. I haven't had a decent night's sleep since all this happened. And now you might find it difficult, too. Because there is still one fact that cannot be buried. After the death of Janos Skorzeny, he and all of his victims were immediately cremated. Why? Remember the legend? 
All those who die from the bite of the vampire will return as a vampire, unless destroyed first. So think about it, and try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, in the quiet of your home, in the safety of your bed, try to tell yourself, it couldn't happen here. <laughs> A few months later, after the airing of that film, a cadre of men would be caught breaking into the offices of the Democratic Party in a Washington hotel called the Watergate. Those events would lead to the impeachment of a president, and later, a film that inspired a new generation of journalists. But for me, I hold a special place in my heart for one determined reporter wearing a seersucker suit and a straw hat who would never take no for an answer. And that's the last frame. Thanks to Michael for spending time with us. To find out more about him and the great work that he's doing at the Bronx Documentary Center, visit bronxdoc.org. And if you're a fan of The Candid Frame, take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store. It helps our ranking, but it also creates awareness of the show. Though it only takes a few minutes, you'll be making a huge difference. Take the time to do it today. Thanks to H. Alicia K. from Canada for their five-star review. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon. For as little as $2 a month, you help us meet the cost of production and help us to bring you these episodes each week. Or if you just want to make a one-time contribution, you can do so via PayPal. It's your support that allows us to bring you conversations that you won't hear anywhere else. Do it today. Thanks to Hans Erhard, Eric Chang, and Charles Bennett for their recent donations. Thank you so much. It was your support that allowed us to create the free Candid Frame app that provides the easiest access to every episode of The Candid Frame. Available for both Apple iOS and Android, you automatically receive the latest episode on your phone or tablet. But you can easily search for episodes based on name or keyword and save your favorite episode for repeated listening. Download it today by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor. You can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at IbadianX. And this is IbadianX, and this is The Candid Frame.